greeting uh, dingbats. I thought it might be worth um, going over some of this conceptual stuff that, um, you know, Bobby did such a good job driving, but had some questions about the general um, gist of some of the stuff we were trying to do. So I wrote some macro things out there, you know, pretty rough. And obviously we'll come up with a more specific playbook dictated by uh, Coach and Alec. But I thought it might be worth going over some of this stuff. So hopefully this is helpful more than confusing. But um, just starting from the beginning, kind of our basic gist of, you know, that circle train we do as a fleet in the beginning of every race so this is more of a pre-start um sequence where everybody's kind of going around in these circles following each other on a train usually this takes place between 60 to 80 meters uh depending on the wind and the goal here is to establish yourself in a position where at your final approach you're either um, tacking into a ley line position of your target area on the portion of the line you selected um, when we were looking at the wind or which side is favored. Um, typically, if you're going to be, you know, tacking more towards the pin third or trying to win the uh, pin, you're going to be tacking lower on the train towards the pin or tacking or jibing towards the weather end uh, ley line probably slightly above so you have room to defend i'll switch up boats so we're the actual little dingbat boat here i nerded out and cut these up and i did label one dingbat um so as we're kind of jockeying our for our position um you know some boats are going to be behind some boats are going to be slightly ahead but obviously the thing we're thinking about in this whole sequence i'll switch it up a little bit this whole sequence is our position forward and back and our position from weather to leeward and what these gaps mean and how we're trying to manage them. Um, for the basis of simplicity, we typically want to remain pretty bow even, closer to the weather boat than the leeward boat, having room to dip down and accelerate when that time comes. Usually the fleet kind of goes together, so you can anticipate that there is going to be a little opportunity to dip down, but that will also um, you know, make you have a certain kind of build. If there's less space, you're going to have to have more of a straight build with little or bare away. That's why it's good to practice these things. If you're early on the line <clears throat> and you do have a big lured gap, then you have all this room to kind of reach down and to catch, take that carrying speed into a big upturn on the racing call. Um, that's pretty rare, but at the same time, it does happen in cases where you've done such a good job building this hole, pushing the weather boat up and letting boats sail through. So you might not necessarily need to be early, but um, the big thing to think about is this lured gap because that's our opportunity to accelerate. Um, when we're approaching the line, typically we're doing this at a slow speed. So we have these little kills that Alec is typically calling uh, to get either distance or kill time and distance to the line. So if this gap's really tight, we might sail a little high slower or carry our speed as close as we can get to this guy and then shoot back up to build this gap again. Um, one of the situations that might happen why we're actually leaving this gap also is because if we have a defending situation, so say these guys are coming in late on port, we're typically making this tack around one minute to one minute 30 on our final approach onto starboard. If somebody's late, they're looking for a hole to either snake or come in late um, with a late hook. And here, what we're gonna do is if this boat on star, I'll switch it up so we have a boom. When this boat's on, on port and we're on starboard and they know we're pro they could tack into our hole, do a nice lee bow here and just take the whole thing away. Instead, we're gonna do bow at them. And as they bow at us, it's called a dial down. We might do some avoiding. Um, but what we're looking for here is for them to either go by or tack to avoid us. And then we shoot back up and re-gauge our lured hole right here. So defending on attack, aiming at them, maybe slightly lower, having them tack early so we can get back into the hole we built so nicely. Um, or ta uh, they tack uh, in a position where they have to go beyond us. 
Um, you're just trying to discourage them. Once these boats all stack up, which can happen, say we have this nice lured hole and it's open and this guy sees it, what he's going to do is try to come in there. What we do is close the door. He's going to say, oh, it's not worth it. There's nowhere to go anyway and keep going beyond. The other defense position on the line is called, um, you know, a late hook or defending on a late hook. And basically, if everybody's kind of in their positions right here and you've built a nice hole, uh, this guy might be coming in late. What we're looking to do here is bow down before the overlap is created. So we're sailing the same speed to force them to go by. And now this gap is virtually non-existent. So they look for another one down the line. Um, the other thing that can happen is if we do get overlapped, or somebody doesn't recognize this soon enough, as soon as the overlap's created, they have lured rights, so we're shooting back up to respect their rights, but typically their shoot's gonna be a little bit behind us. Um, and our reaching speed from the defending will actually carry um, enough speed into the high kill that we have some room to build a higher hole. And even if they end up here, hopefully we carried that reaching speed from the defense to shoot back up. Um, and carry some lure, more lure distance that we have time to accelerate. Um, <clears throat> the accelerations are pretty much intuitive on the uh, distance to lure you have, but typically we're trying to stuff this guy as much as we can to slow him down, A, so we don't get rolled by him, or uh, we can remain bow out, and also so we have this lured gap to bear away. It might be a straight build, reaching build, low build, um, or just a slight bear away with the telltales just nervous on the outside, able to uh, trim back on and go back up to close halt. But it's all pretty dependent on how slow you're creeping um, on the last 30 minutes, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and you know that's that time we're typically between three knots to two knots. <clears throat> the ley line approaches we had did get interesting at times but it's not too complicated uh i think we actually managed this pretty well but i was just going to go over those scenarios so bobby has an idea of what we're trying to sometimes accomplish one of the strategies is if all the boats start to stack up on the starboard ley line <clears throat> which happens you know say the lead boats here everybody's going to tack on their weather hip because they want clean air. So it ends up that all these boats end up sailing a lot of extra distance. So one thing you can do is come in early on port and lead these boats back. Let's put the weather mark a little further away. So our weather marks way up here. Once these we see this ley line stacking up or we actually know it's gonna happen probably at 30% up the beat, we're gonna attack early and lead the group. And that way we have clean air for as long as we want and sailing less distance. So some of these guys are going to get in a position where they have to sail in bad air and hopefully tail off and burn out and have trouble doing it. So when we come in, hopefully before the port ley line, but sometimes on the port ley line, when we tack, we have room to get across because all these boats have been sailing in bad air and sailing extra distance for so long. Then we just overlay a little bit. So we overlay for five or 10 seconds instead of overlaying for, you know, the three to four minutes it might be a slight exaggeration, but, um, the next thing would be uh, lee bowing. And in this situation, you know, it's, it can happen anywhere on the course, but any kind of typical lee bow, you're going to be the port tack boat if you're planning a lee bow. Might be on starboard tack too. But um, if you're on port tack, you're trying to get as close to this boat as possible, rotating bow forward and close enough that they don't have room to put their bow down and also far enough that you don't make them alter course to avoid your tack. Um, and in that situation, we're just trying to get as close to them as we can without fouling them and staying bow forward. And that way, eventually they're gonna tail off because they don't have a great lane to maintain that position. Um, and then also, you know, we had situations where we were ducking and a couple of the different kind of ducks are um, an early duck so say we recognize the situation this far out on an early duck, we're gonna start reaching early. And the goal is as this guy comes across, we put the bow back up just in time that we can sail upwind to just clear his transom. Um, it's a high speed duck and it works really well, but the timing on VMG uh, is important because if you don't come back to that close hauled angle where you're just clearing their transom, anything that they go beyond is VMG you've lost. 
Um, so that's kind of an early duck, early reaching to come back up to a close hold as they go by. And now we've only lost the distance we reach, which we were at uh, an accelerated um, boat speed anyway. So it saves a little time and distance. The other one is if uh, we have boats stacked up to leeward, you know, Alec, I think called this once it was a high duck. And what happens is if this fleet's all stacked up, we know if we're going to have to duck this guy that just made it across these other boats. If we duck him, we're going to lose a lane or not have much opportunity to hold this lane and our lured gap's going to be virtually non-existent. So instead of doing a big low duck <coughs> or a late duck, um, we're going to sail the boat just slightly high and slow. And this is, takes a little bit of finesse and timing on the tactician. But what we're trying to do is just kill, hopefully under a quarter knot of boats, be not very much at all. And we're just slowing down enough that as he goes by, we can put the bow back down and go. Um, again, we're trying to maintain as close a duck to the transom of the boat crossing as possible, but also think about that we're not getting so slow that we're sliding, losing speed, traction, or killing the speed totally. It's just a very mild, uh, within probably 10th of a quarter knot, to just put the bow up high enough that this guy goes across. Now we're accelerating again as just as we can get up to speed as he goes by and then we don't lose anything um, to leeward on the uh, boats off our leeward hip. Um, a late duck is a lot less common. It's more of a crash duck, but it does occasionally happen. Um, as we get close to this boat, say we're on port ley line sailing like this. As we get close to the port ley line, what's going to happen is we know this guy doesn't really want to go beyond, so he's going to attack. Um, and we're looking for that opportunity that either he's going to attack early and leave us alone a little bit so we can continue to continue off his hip. Um, but we know if we start the duck early and he tacks, now we're way into his bad air. So the late duck is kind of thinking if we don't have enough room, now port lay, or if we're anticipating the boat ahead is going to tack. If we know he's going to tack and can anticipate his timing, then we're trying to keep the duck very close as he crosses head to win. As he crosses head to win, he doesn't have any rights. So then we can actually sail our normal course and he has to avoid us as we get, come through and reestablish as the lured boat. Um, the late duck is a little trickier and usually more of an aggressive move and something that's not used a whole ton. So I wouldn't think too much on it. Um, but the big one is if you were in a match race or something and you know you didn't want to sell the duck, you're going to do it as late as possible. And if you're anticipating the tack, you know, it, there is a situation in match racing where this guy might want to tack on your air here. So if you know he's going to try to tack on your air, you duck as late as possible, anticipating his tack um, or hoping he goes a little further to clear out your lane. Um, but again, the late duck is a little more uh, aggressive and something that's not used a ton in fleet racing, but can be valuable. The only caveat to add to that is uh, if they lose their rights, had to win, you actually have the opportunity to sail a little high, slow, and then they don't have the ability to put their bow down and you can hook them later. But it's a more aggressive uh, match racing move that won't be too necessary um, in what we're trying to do. The jibe and some of the stuff that we saw going on at the, um, uh, the sets and the jibe sets and the lured roundings um, is more of a spacing issue than anything. Um, hopefully this, these are good visuals and I'm sure the guys will improve on this quite a lot. Uh, for this one, I'll bring out the big dingbat, bam. Um, let's see if I can find my other lured mark. But say we've rounded the weather mark, um, here so here's our mark and we're leading what we're trying to do here this is an offset leg it's our first weather rounding and um i i think it's something we just didn't do well spacing wise at times um to nobody's fault it's more of just a communication thing as a team and something we need to practice as we go around we're trying to stay high enough that when we set we want our bow setting here what that does, you know, here's the wind. <clears throat> what that does is the boat behind can't go inside because they don't have mark room and it makes it harder for them to roll us. 
uh, because we're going to put our bow, bow right back up and they're going to either have to go above on the offset before they set or um, they're going to have to sail high early on us. So recognizing this situation, which does come up, means that when we do get an opportunity to set, which hopefully the offset's down here, we put our bow down and then come right back up. Um, the one thing I think we were lacking a little bit on the sets was bringing the bow back up. We would stay too low and slow, or it would take us too long to get to the dead downwind position to unload the boat for the set. So what, what, what we want to do is find this unloading angle faster. So it's going to be like a bop unloaded for one to two seconds. Uh, Halyard just gets past the spreaders, bow flies back up quickly. Um, and that apparent wind of the bow moving actually fills the kite quicker and loads you up to an angle where it's high, harder for these guys to roll over you. So what we were kind of getting caught in is rounding the offset tight, staying dead downwind too long as all these guys sail high set here, um, we get rolled and it takes us a really long time to get back up. And that's why they can all just kind of go by us like we were standing still. Um, so I think the thing to think about mostly is the spacing on the offset going at, at a relatively one to one and a half lengths high of the offset leg. So we can bear away set at the offset mark and put the bow right back up as quickly as possible. But I think the thing we need to practice is getting the bow down fast enough and getting the bow back up fast enough. And it takes good boat handling as well as just accurate, uh, um, accuracy in finding the unloading angle and the hot angle. Um, and in this situation, um, it's kind of similar to a jibe set where we're going to do the same thing. We're going to stay high one length to one and a half lengths high off the offset. And then as we come down, trying to set here um, instead of taking it too wide. If we set closer to the offset, nobody can get inside. If we set closer to the offset, it's harder for somebody to get inside to actually roll us because they have to do the same maneuver after you. Um, and it's a little bit of that timing of getting the bow back up as quickly as possible. You remember that one where they snuck inside? It's because we delayed on the jibe set a little bit. Now we have this gap opening up. Now we're sailing dead downwind going into a jibe set. They've already established themselves here. So technically, if we're overlapped, we're in the act of rounding the mark. We've already rounded the mark, I think, under the rule 18.2. I think we're now done once the mark's kind of there and room actually turns off and this might come into a weather lured situation but that's something you can talk to the after guard about <clears throat> so just the general boat handling gist of this though is to keep this tight and same thing as a set if we get the once this uh, clue of the kite gets around the head stay that's when we really want to make the turn fast to get the kite through the jib and come up to a position where nobody could get in there to roll us and we would have an easier time defending. But if we do get in that position where we're defending, say, it, you know, it does happen, let's do it on uh, the offset without a jibe set, would be either matching our competitor <clears throat> or sailing slightly higher than our competitor. So what's going to happen, let's just say we're on a downwind leg after the offset. Um, as this competitor starts to sneak up, it's something that um, anybody who's not trimming or looking around is going to realize. Um, so what we're going to say is, okay, let's just hedge high. And if you're with a really good group in the front of the pack, typically hedging high just tells these guys, listen, we're here to fight. Um, let's not do this. And they typically come back down. But some guys want to go to battle. And as that happens, we want to make sure once they put their bow up, we're matching that angle or slightly above it never below and once this happens the whole time we have to be matching 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 whether they go up or down we're always matching okay um i guess in this nature situation we're the competitor so let for clarification's sake um dingbat's always going to be matching the boat behind that's trying to roll them like this so if we're here they put the bow up we need to do this and I think that's where the, the communication uh, we had got in trouble because we would come up and then Bobby would get really loaded on the helm. So we'd dive back down to keep the boat flat, but this guy would continue on. So I think the, the key here is to realize that we're always matching this boat in a defensive mode, um, trying to stay bow forward to keep their breeze behind us. Um, 
and also sail as fast as they can. The only other thing for like a low defend, I think it was called once, is if there's a lured header from behind with pressure, meaning uh, the breeze is kind of going to lured like this, not filling, you know, when a puff hits, it kind of fingers out like this. And occasionally when it hits, it can go like that, kind of to lure to the boat. And um, if it's a header with pressure, it always gains to the lured position boats downwind. Um, so if that pressure comes in and these guys start sailing just a lower mode than we can handle, we're just trying to hedge a little bit on the low side without losing speed, meaning maybe we're just looking for that perfect wave to get down a little lower to match this angle so we're a little more um, leveraged into the puff, or we're um, just sailing never high, never fast, just focusing on uh, depth and speed but never crashing. You know, the threat here is if we do get into a position where the speed crashes or gets below a tenth of a knot to a quarter knot slow, we have to take that time to sail up high to recharge the speed and then go back down to VMG. So in this case, um, speed crashing or a speed kill at all on a low angle can be as critical as... Um, you know, if you're sailing too fast. So it's a pretty thin mode, but it's just a focus on trying to uh, keep this position. One of the other things that can happen is just a double jibe where we jibe in, take some leverage back into that puff because we know it's going to continue if we think it's persistent and then jibe back. So we're well into it, even if it's a little bit of a compromised lane. Um, so we're just always trying to keep this opportunity to jibe, you know, not at the cost of speed, but say a boat gets here, now you're locked out. The mark's over here. We want to go there. We're locked out. This guy's blocking our jibe. Um, we actually did this pretty well in um, the last leg of the last race where we were in opposite positions. We were the dingbat coming in, kind of soaked inside, had a really good mode downwind, um, was passing these guys on our own speed and merit. And we got to this position where they try to soak. We're never going to sail through their lee. So we always have to focus on just sailing our VMG. If we do get in a locked position, we just have to call lured rights, put this boat back up to their VMG course, and we continue sailing as fast as possible until we'd either decide to jibe or try to break through. You're never really going to break through. So I think the um, goal, you know, tacticians might just want to hang in there as long as possible, and it's a painful position. But the temptation is to steer away from this boat to avoid them. But realizing we have lured rights, and that we sail our VMG mode no matter what and try to maintain this overlap to hold their jibe without getting slow on the other portion of the fleet that might be scattered all over the place, you know. Um, this last little thing is something we did really well, again, on that last leg, is to jump somebody to steal their wind on a jibe. Um, I think that's all we really end up calling it is, all right, do we think we want to jump this guy, jibe on this guy? Um, what we want to do if we're looking for a simul, if we're looking for a simo turn. So as this guy starts to turn, we need to go with him. Um, when we make that turn, what's going to happen is we're trying to focus because of the pivot points of the boat that our bow is slightly bow out. So booms go over. Sorry, these bobby pins are a little stiff. <clears throat> the boom goes over, and now we know our bow is out. So the only way this works because of the way the boats are going to pivot on their keels is if the boat wants to jibe ahead of you and you're going to simo them or say like, okay, watch for the jump. We're going to jump this guy. We have to be either directly behind or slightly to leeward because on the pivot, our bow is going to be forward on them. Um, the way it doesn't work is if we're slightly to weather. Um, so to guarantee this actually works, usually you want to come out just on the edge of high. So this would be a bad setup because when we pivot here, his bow is forward of ours and his air is clear, right? Say the wind's coming from here. Air is clear. This is our dirty air. So if we are in a position dead behind or slightly to leeward and behind, or even better overlapped him behind them. We're holding him. We dictate, but he might go for it anyway. You know, he, he can jive there if uh, he thinks that we don't have to avoid. But dead behind or slightly leeward behind is when we come out, we want to come out just slightly hotter than them. 
and that will guarantee that even beyond the pivot that we have actually um, blanketed them enough that they're not going to be able to sail through our lee and we'll soak down win the race like we did in the last leg of that last race um, if you're in this position sorry I'll go back to this if you're in this position as a defender so now say we're leading and we're at risk of getting jumped there's a couple things we can do here um, we can it's called either a no look jibe meaning we don't sell it uh, so I don't stand up beforehand um, everybody tries their best not to look behind you're just doing everything you can to show that you're going straight and not jiving and then everything happens a little faster and you jibe and hopefully they're uh, confused enough by that that when they jibe even if it's two seconds behind you're gonna sail a little hotter and get clear out so you can continue on um, so that no look jive is all about what you're selling you know as a, a, a crew and a helmsman to show that hey we're not gonna jive we're not gonna jive we're not gonna jive oh jiving you know and then they're slightly they're just like stutter step behind coming out a little hot to defend again like we talked about um, on the offset leg or other portions of the course defending high enough that we can keep our air clear meaning slightly higher angle or matching the angle on the boat above that is a threat um, so the no look jive is one way to prevent getting jumped the other one is uh, a fake jive which works sometimes it's wicked fun when it does it sucks when it doesn't but um, a fake jive did I say fake jive yeah a fake jive is when um, you act like you're jiving so I'll stand up and start pulling the sheets like I'm trying to start a jive, but I'm just kind of running my hands over them so nothing's actually happening with the sails. And um, the same on the tiller, maybe you'll push, but you won't grab the tiller, so it'll look like you're jiving, but you're just sliding your hand up the uh, base of the tiller extension. And, um, you know, Alex going to make a big show of jiving, jiving, and hopefully that will cause them to uh, go jibe and we just continue on so that's a fake jibe um the other one is a belay audible or a half jibe you know you start the turn you start the jibe um and then hopefully this guy bites and goes with it and jibes away and as you're not getting too low that you're losing speed so you're not actually jibing here or the tech or it is a real jibe and the tactician says belay cancel uh audible whatever he's going to say and what happens there is we throw the weight back to lure, do a big rock up back to our VMG position, sailing slightly hotter of that VMG angle, and flatten the boat back down into our regular VMG speed. So it's a kinetic move, um, but it's basically just a cancel on a portion of the jibe. Um, I think that's about everything that I had. I had some, the notes that I sent to you guys, so... Jumping a boat down wind, fake jibe, jibe set, um, regular reach set. <clears throat> but I think a lot of this stuff will get into more detail. It's not an official playbook, um, just some concepts I thought might help and some fun stuff, you know, to for Bobby to talk about with the kids over Christmas break. Maybe they can play finger boats or play around with some cutout boats. And uh, you guys could go over these concepts that we wrote about in the notes. All right, guys. Thanks, dingbats. Merry Christmas, bros.